Hello, everyone, and welcome to Genesis Cinema. I'm here today with Digum. How are you? I'm doing great, Jenna. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing all right. Thanks for being here. Um, we're here to review a movie called The Swimmer, directed by Frank Perry. Um, I think – I could be wrong, but I think from 1968. Yes. Um, and, yeah, I'm excited to talk about it. Had you seen this movie before? Yeah, I had um, – picked up um the indicator blu-ray on a whim because i had heard it was good you know like uh the movie has somewhat of like a reputation and then i i think it was on sale for like seriously like 12 bucks for for, like the limited edition indicator at least oh wow and i was like um i'm gonna pick it up and check this uh thing out and then watched it and i became kind of obsessed with it (laughs) yeah it is pretty awesome i have a friend um who i I still talk to him a little bit, but we met like probably like almost 10 years ago and he was really into the swimmer. He introduced me to this. So I saw it probably like maybe three or four years ago. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So, and he had been talking about it for a long time, but I, I eventually did end up seeing it, but I can't remember if I had, cause at some point I had the grindhouse releasing Blu-ray. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can't remember if my first watch was on that, but yeah, it's a movie. I, I I really liked it from the first watch, and I think I li- liked it even more this time. Yeah. Um, at this point, and I usually give my rating at the end, but I'll just throw it out there now. I mean, at this point, it's a full five for me. Um. Yeah, I think I gave it a four point five again. Um, but it honestly might as well be a five. It's pretty pretty perfect, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. And uh I think I, mean, I think I've, you've talked to me about this a little bit in DMs and whatnot, but it's like a David Lynchian movie. Yeah, I call it like proto Lynch in yeah, a lot of ways. For sure. Like 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 I I would it would be shocking to me if um David Lynch stopped being cagey one day about his influences for anything and was yeah. like uh didn't mention this movie as one of them because like there's so much um I I want I, I wanted to watch this in Blue Velvet because I feel like they have a lot of the same DNA. These mm-hmm. these two movies, like you know the um, the nightmare of what uh, what is actually you know underneath suburbia and the American dream. I feel like there's they're they're carrying a lot of the same coding, you know. For sure, I can definitely see that connection. Um, and it has like a dreamy sort of old Hollywood aesthetic, but like underneath it's something different, which is, I mean, David Lynch does that a lot in his movies for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's on the surface, you know, uh, the, everything is, is fine and technicolor and beautiful, but the whole time you're, there is a, um, there's just enough off at the beginning to where you know that something is weird. <laughs> or like so, something's not right, you know. Yeah, for sure. And just to give my interpretation of it, like I feel like uh, it's like some sort of like ghost story. That's what I what I come away with by watching it. Um, to me, it feels like, and that's sort of Lynchian in some way. Um, like I just feel like he, and maybe I'm not reading it correctly, but I I feel like he's like swimming through his like past memories and like dealing with like old old issues and hangups and like things from his personal life. And like, at first it starts normal and it's just like, you know, surface level interactions. And then it starts to get like harder and harder. And the, the nastier stuff starts to come out. But I see it as like, and they, I don't think it needs to be literal necessarily, but like, I see it as like, he is somebody who has died and he's dealing with his past life. If that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, and because you know the way I was looking at it this time a lot was I was like, you could almost view this as like you know a weird perpetual cycle that he's living in, mm-hmm. where like 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 um I I I had read the um the uh, author of the original short story had had looked at um used like Narcissus as like an inspiration that that you know story and um. Dante's Inferno and things like that, where it's, you know, having to go through all these different stages of things. And, and, you know, I, you can almost view it because like, 
starting at the beginning of the movie, I have no idea where he even comes from. You know what I mean? Yeah. He almost just appears out of nowhere like a like a spirit or like a you know like some sort of being that that doesn't exist on like a normal plane in a weird way almost. Yeah, for sure. And and then you know if you, if you, you know uh, and then at, you know by the end he's a mess, but it's like he could, you can could almost see this being like a punishment that he's enduring every single day. You know, like going through this same cycle every day of of having to live through this realization of what he did and what his life is. Yeah, for sure. And I can see it like to go back to Lynch, like Lynch is known for his movies having dream logic and sort of being having a lot to do with dreams. But like in my dreams, I'm always like faced with some task that's like. <laughs> incompletable or like yeah. I, I like I just I'm doing something I'm trying to get something that like I just sort of like loop around and like it just keeps going and going and going and like that like sort of is similar to this and the way he, and how his task of just wanting to swim to his house feels yeah 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 it feels like in like an impossibility yeah but sure. it's you know it's um it, yeah it is that dream logic of being like something that is impossible but mm. you, but um yeah like and it's 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 shot like a dream too right 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 like like there's so many shots in it that I'm like this is total Lynchian dream weirdness like well they have the great like like. like uh what would you call it? Like fading and like yeah, that's exactly like over splicing. <laughs> all like, this stuff, especially when it's like uh um uh when they're running in the horse thing, which is so bizarre. But it's like cross fading the shots of Julie with him running and jumping and stuff like that, and she's mm-hmm. like smiling, and it's it's just really strange and dreamy, and it's like honestly shot like really beautifully, but it's like really bizarre. Yeah, there's some interesting, like, I love all that stuff. There's also shots towards the end where he's, like, sort of, like, falling apart and unraveling, and he's standing in the pool. Yeah, and, there's, like, quick uh, cutting a lot of things. Yeah, it'll, like, cut into, like, a close-up of the background. All of a sudden, the water will become, like, very strange-looking. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I like some of that stuff, too. Yeah, and and, and um, I I was really interested in this, this time because this was my, you know, the first time you watch it, you're kind of uh captured by the mystery of it like what is what's what's going on right like like that's the whole idea behind behind the initial watch is like well, well what is cuz you know that something is wrong <laughs> like something's off mm-hmm. but i i you can't quite place it until you get to like the almost like 20 minutes until the end of the movie basically like all of a sudden you you it that's when the when the picture starts to form really and then um so this time I was much more interested in looking at the structure and the way that it kind of unravels and the way the characters interact because it I it was really interesting to watch it now having you know cuz not being so concentrated on trying to solve uh the puzzle so to speak but it's so right. interesting how it's like it literally is structured that each pool he's getting a little closer to reality each time Mm -hmm. because like the first pool they don't even really it seems like the people don't even really know like what's going on with him right like 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 they don't seem to even know that he he my presumption is that you know his wife left him they don't have any money uh his kids left him kind of thing they don't even seem to really know that because they don't even acknowledge when he brings up them that it that it's weird or, but the closer he gets, the more people seem to know and be sort of clued in on that something is like seriously wrong with him. Yeah, obviously, you know, culminating in the people at the public pool, you know, being very blunt with him about the situation. But, yeah. uh, it's, and that, it, that scene just turns into like pure chaos. Oh, it's, so, like, yeah, when he's like, <laughs> it's hard not to burst out laughing when he goes like crawling up that rock because it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. I was, I was, you know, it's interesting to have all these vignettes with these little pools and this little interaction with, with these people and the way that it, it, 
unravels the story, but also has like clues you in on the character of, you know, Ned and stuff like that. It's, it, I was really fascinated by that this time. And I was trying to make a serious Dante's Inferno connection because there's like this almost the same amount of pools as the circles of hell and stuff like that. So I'm like kind of be like, okay, like what does this pool <laughs> represent? You know, I was like really trying to get like way too, uh, uh, analytical about it for sure. Well, I can definitely see that connection, but to me, like instead of like a hell analogy, I think it's like, I see it as like a purgatory or like yeah. some sort of like, you know, which I think is like what being a ghost is. Like you're in some sort of weird purgatory or like limbo. Um, but I thought one thing that I was thinking about on this viewing, and I don't know, I can't remember exactly if I thought about it much in the last one, but it's just like, I feel like you first start to see that there's something wrong with him or maybe he's questionable and the way he handles like the Julie character and like when she, the girl who's like his former babysitter. Yeah. Um, and she starts like admitting having a crush on him, but she's obviously like very young and like, and then he's this older man and shout out to Frank of film junk, Frank Knezich, yeah. who, uh, <laughs> said that this movie was the start of the older man bod. Oh yeah, the 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 uh Harrison Ford yeah, showing Harrison off the Ford. older man bod. <laughs> and there's some others he mentioned, but I forget what they were, but yeah. but he's an older he's an older guy for sure. And he's then fifty two here. Yeah. Which I guess is maybe not too old these days, but um but whenever she's talking about like, you know, liking him or whatever, but she seems very innocent and childlike but he seems just to like lean into it. And then like, she ends up like, he ends up like creeping her out and then she runs away. So I feel like that's, I feel like that scene is sort of the first that hints at like, maybe he's a little bit odd and questionable. What I think is interesting too, is um he, uh did you bring up the, the kids thing? Mm-hmm. Uh When he visits Shirley, I think they, brings up that he's always he's always like hanging around with the kids which is weird but it, I, I think it more has to do with like he seems like really like immature in like a lot of ways you know yeah and and i think that also is like displayed in the scene with the the, the little boy mm-hmm. when they're in the pool and stuff like that and and that scene is bizarre in its own way but like yeah like that that scene with julie is really weird when she's talking about um having a crush on him when she was younger and stuff like that. And he's like, well, why didn't you tell me? And it's like, it's so bizarre, <laughs> but yeah. like, you know, like it's, it's, uh, it's somehow in equal measures, charming and, and like disturbing. Mm-hmm. And like, uh, I was, <laughs> when they go to that party, when it's him and her, right. And, and they have the, uh, uh, champagne. I just, oh, this time I was just thinking like, how weird is this that none of these people are saying anything about this? Yeah. <laughs> like, he, like, he, like, he just well, rolls 60s, up with so her and they're like, oh, this is normal. <laughs> and I'm like, this, <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, what was I going to say? I forget. There was once, um, sorry, I'm blanking out. Oh, uh, what I was going to say is that it was, it was odd when, uh, Julie's talking about computer dating, how she met somebody on the computer. Oh, yeah. That seems to be some weird, like, <laughs> I'm sure it was a real thing, but it's just funny how, like, you hear that now, and this is a movie from 1968, and um, it's just funny because you wouldn't think they had anything anywhere close computer to the dating. internet. <laughs> but, yeah, I thought that was an inter- or a funny little moment. And, you know, Something this time I was watching, the amount of alcohol in the movie is yeah. really interesting. <laughs> like, you know, like just constantly being like, oh, have a drink. Like, like, they're like trying to stop him from swimming. Mm-hmm. And like, no, just sit, just, just sit down and have a drink with us. Like, like, you know, like, no, no, no. Like, it's really weird where it's like, you know, um, I guess it's like a sixties thing where it's like, you don't need a therapist. You can just have scotch on the rocks or whatever. But like, you know, it, it, uh, at every stop almost, there's, there's, there's 
the prospect of having a drink. Yeah. Well, I definitely wonder if that's like, you know, when you're an adult or like an adult, like older adult, like 40s, 50s, it's like don't like confront your feelings, like just drink, like you said. Um, but also I could see it as like just you have all these like nice sort of pools and pools are seen as like a status symbol. Yeah. And I, and I feel like a lot of people when they're like hanging around the pool, they just like to drink, like they'll have their bar or whatever. And like, um, I can also see it as that. Yeah. Cause I, I, I think one of the first lines of the movie is like, I drank too much last night and, and people say it like six times in that first initial, like five minutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. which we, you know, I, I, I think has a lot to do with, um, you know, I, I think a lot of the movie is putting distance between Ned and reality. And I think the alcohol obviously aids in that probably, you know, <laughs> like, and being like, you know, like, don't think about what's actually happening and don't think about, you know, the reality of the situation. Don't think about the fact that you're getting older and aging, which I think is a big theme in the movie, you know, um, which is why he's obsessed with, swimming and pools and stuff like that. Right. Um, I, I just think it, it was interesting to look at that. And there was, um, like I said, it's literally like every stop. Somebody's like, have a booze. And he's the, and sometimes he's like, nah, like I don't want to, like, <laughs> yeah. but they're so insistent about it. Uh, it's, it's, it just adds to that layer of like fake politeness. Mm-hmm. That like American dream, suburban deconstruction, like just this level of like pseudo niceness to be like, oh, have a drink. Like, yeah, for sure. Another weird scene, like, cause everybody's like you said, is so polite and sort of fake nice. But another scene that's sort of an early one of like something weird is going on or something sort of negative is going on. Um, is when he goes to that one house and the lady like tells him like I don't want you here and like yes um that was interesting and I'm not sure it's like exactly. the first sign that something is like really wrong in his head yeah because he doesn't seem to have a have a um throughout the whole film he doesn't seem to have a grip on time mm-hmm. or where he is or what year it is even um, right I, I, which which I think they actually kind of give it a number when he sees Shirley, cause she says, I haven't been in Toronto in three years. So obviously he's been maybe living three years in the past even, but yeah, I think, think there's an implication that, um, that guy is dead or something. That's the guy's mom. I think okay. that's what they're, what they're implying that. Cause, cause you know, I was, I, cause you were talking about him being sick and in the hospital and stuff like that. Said you I, never even came to see him or you were yeah, just yeah. to him. Yeah, yeah, and she was like, you didn't, you never saw him in the hospital. So I was like, obviously he was like sick or something and died or whatever. And she, Cause she, she says this is my house now. So, mm-hmm. but it, it was, you know, that's kind of the first, to me, that was the first time where it was like, all right, there's something really, um, wrong here. Because when he meant like, the, the two pools before that, when he mentions his kids or whatever, people aren't like, what? Mm-hmm. You know, like, uh, or, or his wife, they aren't like questioning him, but, Starting then, that's when th- things kind of start to unravel. Right. Yeah. And I, I I like it as it goes on more and more and just seeing things come apart. Another movie it reminds me of is um, Three Women, the Robert Altman movie. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's another sort of dreamy. And that's that's after this movie. Before, yeah. like before this, I can't think of much else that would be comparable other than like Persona or something like that. <laughs> It's it's an inter- it's interesting the time period, right? Sixty eight is kind of um the perfect time for this. Mm-hmm. It's like it still feels like old Hollywood almost, you know? Yeah, for sure. And you have Burt Lancaster. Who's yeah, like I mean, a traditional leading man. Mm-hmm. It ha- it has a very sort of old Hollywood color palette in the way that it's shot. It's gorgeous yeah. looking, and the score is like a traditional older like movie score, which it's a, it's a great score too. I think, um, God, what's his name? Um, it was his first uh, score too. I can't remember. Um, um but it, 
Marvin Hamlish. Yeah, yeah, it was his first uh, film score. Um, and it's fantastic. Um, it's said very old Hollywood, but it's it's like it's like sitting on the edge of chaos and order in a way. Where exactly? <laughs> it's like it's like a, it's like it's like the border between old Hollywood and coming up in the next decade with seventies and things getting a little stranger, you know? Yeah, it does sort of feel. I don't wonder what Tarantino would think of this movie or if he's seen it. So it feels like sort of that movie that would be they might talk about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood or something as the shift from the old Hollywood to the new Hollywood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm curious if Rick Dalton thinks this is like a hippie movie or like a, you know. Yeah, I could see them mentioning it as like a stupid (laughs) hippie movie. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) But yeah, I love the movie. And I think Frank Perry is a really interesting director. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I've seen any of his other movies, but like there's yeah, uh, there's definitely ones I've heard of, like David and Lisa. Yeah. Um, Rancho Deluxe, which I think is like a partner label release for Vinegar Syndrome. Yeah, that was from uh, Fun City. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Mommy Dearest, I think, was yep. a big movie. He did uh, Diary of a Mad Housewife as well. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. There's so- a, there's a bunch, but I think I've only seen The Swimmer, but I need to see more. Yeah, I hope they're all, you know, I I've, I've never seen anything else either, but if it's if it's anything sort of strange like this, I kind of definitely need to check it out because it's, you know, well I just I, saw I, a bombshell. I'm looking at his Wikipedia and apparently Katy Perry is his niece. No way. <laughs> Which is insane. Oh my god, Frank Perry Katy. Oh my goodness. <laughs> this is crazy. This is a revelation. I never would have thought they were actually related. I, mean, I would think that was just so a coincidence. Funny. Um when and his his wife wrote um the screenplay mm-hmm. as well, so it's it's definitely like a family affair kind of thing. Um, yeah, like you know, uh, I was I was really interested because I was like looking up a lot of notes about the behind the scenes stuff. I think this film ended up having technically like three or four directors at the end of production. Yeah, I saw somewhere that Sidney Pollack was like somehow involved. Yeah, Sidney Pollack directed a couple scenes. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that that happened. I guess they were they were unhappy after the first test screening, and they like fired Frank Perry, and then yeah, brought Sidney Pollack in and a couple other folks, and they had to like they like replaced actors. Hmm. Like, yeah, I saw like, the girl who played um, Julie was replaced, yeah. or the original one was replaced. Like, um, Billy D. Williams was in the movie, and they, like, replaced him. <laughs> That's weird. Like, a lot of weird stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he, he played, which is, I think he played the um, bartender in that one scene. So they, they were, like, reshooting stuff, and I read that Burt Lancaster paid, like, $10,000 out of his own pocket to finish the movie. What's nice? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a lot of really weird stuff like that where it, it just was like, um, and like, I think I guess Burt Lancaster was their their like um, fourth choice mm-hmm. behind like um, I think it was like I remember Paul Newman and George C. Scott were two of them. Which this movie with George C. Scott would have been fucking weird. I could see Paul Newman, but not George C. Scott. <laughs> George C. Scott is bizarre. Um, <laughs> But yeah, like like there's a lot of weird stuff with the behind the scenes of this. Um, I mean, it it being based on a 12 page short story just is strange in itself. But there was there's a lot a few of movies like that. Like I think They Live is based on like a really short short story. Yeah, yeah. I I, I guess they they also like butted heads a lot. Uh, Burt Lancaster and uh, Frank Perry and stuff like that on set. And a lot of mm-hmm. weird behind the scenes. Uh, a terminal, and I guess the the um, I was listening to like a commentary thing. I guess the Joan Rivers scene took seven days to shoot for some reason. <laughs> That's weird. Seven days for that? Just for that one little moment? <laughs> like it's so weird. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if there was more that was cut out. Well, and and that's a really bizarre scene too, right? Because like he he really is like that's the first time where I feel like. Um, the way he speaks is, 
um, shown to be weird or bizarre. Mm-hmm. Like, cause like, he's kind of like flowery in the way that he speaks, right? It's very poetic. And then that's the first time somebody's like, I've never met anybody that talks like you. This is weird. <laughs> like, <laughs> he's like, come and, come and be my love. I think he says or some shit like that. Yeah. And it's like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Yeah, he does. I mean, it's sort of that transatlantic accent, but then I guess he sort of takes it to another level. With yeah, his way of speaking. Yeah, it's it's the accent, it's the cadence, it's the the flowery, mm-hmm. very very flowery language that is kind of like poetic and it is really, you know, interesting. Um, And I don't know why this just popped in my head, but I love what he says. That's my wagon, man. About the, the the hot dog cart, it kills me. I don't know why. When he like, that's my wagon, man, is a hilarious way to say that. And it seems to make everyone really angry, which is how it's weird. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, no, it's not. Yeah. And the one guy ends up like attacking him, and he's like, "I'll," she's like, "I'll send my lawyer, or have my lawyer contact you tomorrow." Trying to do a whole thing. Yeah. But yeah, I really love the movie. Um, I think it's interesting. This has like releases from like multiple, um, like boutique Blu-ray labels. Like it's on Grindhouse releasing. I think there's more. Yeah. Like you said, Indicator. Indicator. I think Umbrella put it out in Australia. Mm-hmm. And then uh, it's not on Criterion, but it's on the Criterion channel. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a very interesting pick for a cult film, right? Because this is you would qualify this as a cult film, and it's very non-traditional because it's a drama. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's a weird psychotic drama, but it's still a drama. But people really seem to, um, and it, you know, I guess when it initially released, it was not well received, like all cult films, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, it's just one of those strange ones where you're like, cult people that like cult or psychotronic cinema just really kind of tune into it for some reason. Yeah, for sure. And it's just that little bit of strangeness that little bit of outside reality that you know makes it a perfect fit for like a boutique label you know like if vinegar syndrome put this out on 4k I'd be like that's that makes sense to me of yeah, course they would sure. put it on 4k like in the, like a giant vsu packaging or something i'm like yeah of course no yeah i definitely think it should get some sort of 4k release at some point because yeah, it's a beautiful beautiful movie mm-hmm. and it's an early example of like a movie that i love or a kind of movie that I love, and which is like just like this, like we've said, like a Lynchian sort of just fever dream narrative. Like I love movies that exist in like a weird kind of liminal space, <laughs> for lack yeah. of a better term. Yeah, and can just like play with a good dream logic and don't even have to be literal. It's funny because I just rewatched Bo is Afraid, which I know you love as well. Yeah, um, huge fan, and. I think that movie is a really good example of something because I've always thought like people, when they watch movies, they tend to fall back on like, Oh, this isn't realistic. That wouldn't happen. This wouldn't happen. But like, why does a movie have to be realistic in any way? Like it could just be non, it could be completely non literal. And like, I was thinking like Bo is afraid. Like it's, it's one of the biggest examples I think of something that like, it isn't literal at all. There has this, this, there doesn't have to be this meaning to it, or there's a meaning. I'm just saying, like, people ask questions like, you know, like, is this character really dead, or like, what happened there? Or there always has to be like, this like, exact answer. Yeah. But like, it doesn't. It can just be non-literal, but still have a meaning to it. If that makes any sense. It can just be where you know, like, with a film like this, or like, Bo's Afraid. The emotions are more important than the literal what's happening, right? Mm-hmm. Especially in something like Bo is Afraid, where it's like the emotions of the scene and the 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 contents are way more or important than like the logic of it, right? And I I you know as shitty as it may sound, like that's like an advanced level film fan thing to really get into. Yeah. Like, like there are people that I I would love everybody to watch most uh, uh, David Lynch, but there's a lot of people that aren't ready. You know, there are, mm-hmm. there are a lot of people that aren't ready to watch The Swimmer. You know, because I know that they just wouldn't enjoy it or 
appreciate well, sadly, it. Sadly, you know? most might write it off just based on the fact that it's from the 60s. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, that's the thing, you know. It's a whole movie, but, like, uh, you know, it's... it. Um, if we're talking about, like, you know, just, like, trying to get my sister to watch it or something like that. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it just takes a certain level of, of sort of film appreciation to even get into something like this. Mm-hmm, for sure. Um, I mean, I remember even I considered myself a film fan as, like, when I was, like, 18, 19. I mean, I love movies going way back to being a kid, but, like, I remember when I was, like, 18 yeah. or 19, like, writing David Lynch off and being yeah, like, totally. you know, those movies just don't make any sense. There's just no reason to anything that's happening there. And I can't even believe I thought like that at this yeah, point. Yeah, I mean, I'm in this, the same boat where, you know, movies like this, like, I would watch them and be like, well, it doesn't, you know, make any sense. Like, what, what's the point of this? Blah, 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 blah. You know, mm-hmm. uh, talking about, you know, well, the plot points are important, this and stuff like that. It's like, well, it's not really, to be honest. Like, <laughs> you know, uh, it, it, in a way, in a way, it's the same debate that, um, Reed and Jay had on last week's film junk that they always have, where it's like, you know, what is this film really trying to do? And if it's not trying to have a logical and consistent plot, then that's not what's important. Yeah, I think it's just know? about the intent. Like, if it is trying to do that and it's failing, then that's one thing, but, um, but if it's going for something dreamy, then that's a whole different scenario. And it's a total success at that, you know. Mm-hmm. It's a it's just a total um, sort of proto Lynch is how I keep uh, putting it because that's what it is. It's a total like successful just vibe piece where you're just living through because you know there is a plot, there is a story to this. Obviously, it's not just all like disconnected images. But it's, you know, if you can key into the mood and the vibe of it, that's what's going to take you further than actually being invested in the plot, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And another thing I like about movies like this, like this and Bo's Afraid, like, I feel like they get at, like, what is going on on the inside. Like, if you looked at somebody's life and just portrayed their life exactly as it is, it would be pretty boring. Yeah. Like, seeing what just happens day to day. But, like, you... If you portray, try to portray in some way what's going on on the inside, I think that's like, I think that's what those two movies are examples of. Um, I really like that. And Mulholland Drive and tons of yeah. other Lynch movies. Oh, yeah, yeah, too. totally. Yeah, yeah. That's what I think is, is interesting. Um, so I listened to the short story today. Mm-hmm. I, I listened to the audiobook and it's a very internally told story. Like it's all, you know, like, uh, first person, narration you know that kind of thing and and i think the film does a good job of taking that and putting it outward in that way where it's like you know if you just showed the exactly what was happening it would be pretty boring to look at Mm -hmm. be a boring watch but you know taking those internal thoughts and making them manifest through the way it's shot the physicality you know um the cutting all that stuff like that that's what makes it special that's what makes it something that is like really, really interesting. For um, sure. And sort of the best movies like like a David Lynch, like Mulholland Drive is a perfect example of just like somebody taking somebody's worldview or their thoughts or their, you know, their <laughs> living in unreality and making it manifest on film is that's the, uh, like a perfect example of that. And I would wonder if, like you said, like if Lynch is inspired by this movie because I can see direct comparisons between this and. Um, a hole in drive with the yes. cross fading, which he's laying there on the couch and it's cross fading the, you know, the trees as she's like dreaming about Hollywood. Yeah. Yeah. And like, like some of the images of the faces when they have like their, uh, when the, her friend, like they see the dead body and then she runs out and has her hands over her face. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's, it, um, he said it would be shocking to me if, if, if one day, you know, Lynch is unfortunately on his deathbed and he's like, all right, I'm going to fess up. <laughs> I'm going to fess up about everything. And it would be shocking to me if he wasn't like, oh, yeah, The Swimmer was was like a huge influence on me. Well, another movie that, like, I think is a big influence, and I'm sure this is talked about, but, um, like, I watched Meshes of the Afternoon, the, like, Maya Darren short film. Mm-hmm. And that, not even just in the dream logic and the, you know, surrealness of it, but, like, because that's an influence. I could see being an influence, obviously. 
but just the vibe of like they shoot in this like little like old Hollywood bungalow and like it just reminds me exactly of the scenes where they're in the apartment building and they walk in and like see the dead body laying on the bed and like all of that stuff in Mulholland Drive feels yeah. very meshes of the afternoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you know, like I'm I'm I, I'm I always hate to do the thing where it's like you are really watching something or you're re- you're really invested in some particular thing and you like start comparing the two because you're just, you know, into a certain thing. But I'm I'm rewatching a bunch of um Charlie Kaufman right now. Mm-hmm. I can't help but feel a lot of that in this too. Like like just that that same kind of stuff, you know, that same kind of unreality. Well it's nice um, in New York for sure. Yeah, taking taking what's the internal and making it external through visuals or through, you know, uh dialogue or whatever, you know, like it's it's really uh I think it's more influential than a lot of people would give it credit for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I wonder how many – I remember the first time I heard of this movie was, like, a long time ago. I mean, probably, like, 10 years ago. I heard Jay talk about it um, in one of, like, the What We Watch segments, like, going way back. Um, and it always seemed, like, really interesting to me, just the idea of it. But I didn't end up seeing it until later. But, um, yeah, I wonder how, like, if you went back to, like, the 90s or the 80s, like, how well-known this movie was. Yeah, yeah, I, I'd be really curious about that because – and now they would live in the world of of uh, boutique Blu-rays and stuff like that. But you know, like there was when I was like doing some YouTube research earlier, there was a bunch of Turner Classic movie segments with this movie. Mm-hmm. There was Gilbert Gottfried presenting it as one of his picks <laughs> for his, when he was programming it or whatever. So you know, there are some folks that are that know it, you know, that are that are kind of you know. Well, Turner uh-huh. Classic Movies is always good for like they'll they'll show some stuff that isn't even available, but you'll see it on Turner Classic Movies. Yeah. Um, like there's a movie I really like called Darker Than Amber, mm-hmm. which is only available like on a YouTube like bootleg TCM. <laughs> yeah. Um. Why well, I don't even think the one I watched is like some like weird VHS like taken from a like English like TV broadcast, but there is the highest quality like version that I think is around or like accessible online is a TCM broadcast. So, but that's one movie that I think would work perfectly. Like my dream is that darker than Amber will get released on fun city editions or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Or like, uh, God, what's that company? Uh, radiance or something like that. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, but I think that's about all I had to say for this movie. Did you have any other thoughts? Um, no, that's about it. You know, it's just a great film. Um, let me look at my notes here. I'm, I'm pretty sure I touched on all of them. <laughs> Cause, you know, like, uh, I was, I was, it's so funny. When a movie is this good, we, I start watching it and I start writing down notes. Yeah. And about 30 minutes in, I just stop because I just start watching the movie and enjoying it. You know? <laughs> Yeah, I have a hard time keeping notes, too. I did try to keep some in a notebook, but I didn't get very many down. Usually I just watch the movie <laughs> because it's hard to keep it at the same time. Yeah, yeah, usually I just end up, in, yeah, you know, enjoying the film and, and, and trying to, to keep all my thoughts in my head. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, but I, I just like to have some, like, bullet points. But, yeah, just so – because it is hard to, like, sometimes it'll things will slip your mind, but – for this movie, I only had like three or four like major notes, but I did end up thinking of most of the things I had, I had to talk about. <laughs> well, it's it's more of an experience than anything else, you know. You're you're you you live through the swimmer. I love that the uh, tagline on the poster. It says, uh, "When you watch the swimmer, will you think about you?" Yeah, <laughs> you know, like, that's an interesting tagline. Yeah, like it's really you know. Uh, I I I I um. I have a, a, a swimmer poster in my office that says, you know, uh, I love the uh, the uh, tagline, which says they had the pools, but he had their wives, which I think is another great one. <laughs> the one where the first quote you mentioned, that poster, I would like to have that 
yeah. poster framed. It's a really nice poster. Well, it's, well it's funny. I remember seeing seeing the shot in the movie, being mm-hmm. like, "Oh, that's the shot that's on the post that they use for uh, the poster. That's like the close up that they use." Is it the one like towards the end where? Yeah, his um, hair is like all wet, and he's like, you know, yeah, looking at. I think he's looking at Shirley. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, because she's like very repulsed by him, and he's has these rose uh, tinted glasses about them having an affair. Well, he's like, she lo- or you loved it. You she's loved it. it, yeah. <laughs> That's my <laughs> wagon, man. <laughs> But yeah, Burt Lancaster is great in this movie, and I I like him as a gen- actor in general. I mean, he's just he's great in a lot of stuff. Yeah, can um, I, have I seen him in anything else? I've seen him in The Killers, which is a '40s movie. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm trying to look up other movies I've seen him in. He always oh, has yeah. that sort of. He's the doctor in Field of Dreams. Okay, okay, that's I've probably the only other that. thing I've seen him in, to be honest. <laughs> I've seen Sweet Smell of Success. Which he's good in. Yeah. Um, I think that's it. It's the Killers, Swimmer, Sweet Small Success, Field of Dreams. Those are the Burt Lancaster movies I've seen. Oh, yeah. I've also seen Buffalo Bill and the Indians, which he has a small part in. It's a Robert Altman movie. What a what a what a career, you know? Yeah. But he's also in From Here to Eternity, um, which is a big movie. The Leopard, yeah. Judgment at Nuremberg. Mm-hmm. The list goes on, but <laughs> yeah, he's a good actor. Um, well, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, thanks again for being here. Yeah, thanks for, um, having me again. Yeah, no problem. And it was, it was definitely a good watch. Um, and thanks everyone for, for listening and see you next time. Bye.